Okay, so hopefully you've now had a look at the questions uh, one, two, and moved on to number three on page 142. And that should mean that you've read through those three um, fairly short texts um, and maybe jotted down some notes for questions one and two that you can uh, refer to if, uh, perhaps in class. Uh, if you've not reached that point, pause the video and uh, come back in a moment. Okay, so in question three, um, you should now have your, your answers in front of you for question three. Uh, we have two questions for each of the texts, and this is just like um, uh, part of the, the reading paper that you'll get in the CAE. So, uh, as we've come across these before, one of the big difficulties that people have is not so much picking the right answer as discarding the wrong ones. And that's very much the case in most, if not all, of the questions that we're looking at today. And in the first uh, text, then, about the Futuro House, or the Futuro House, perhaps, um, there are two questions. Uh, in the first paragraph, the writer suggests that when developing the future of Mati Suronen, and then we have to uh, decide A, B, C, or D. Okay, the answer is D, and the reason for this is that on line 9, line 9, it talks about a much more, uh, or how the, the architect had a much more intuitive approach. Um, in question, in, in answer A, was keen to keep the design a secret. That's not mentioned at all. Uh, B and C, to me these look to be testing whether you're projecting your own conclusions onto the situation, rather than understanding what the writer actually says. And I think this is something which, uh, in, in this part of the CAE e exam, or in comprehension in general at CAE level, uh, the trap to avoid falling into is exactly that. It's understanding the difference between your uh, projected conclusions and what you can read as implied, which is what makes this so difficult, by the writer. So the difference is what are you projecting onto the situation or what is the writer implying in what they say. And there's a very fine line. I'm aware that that's you know, the, the difficulty that many of you will come across. In question two, uh, what does the writer find strange about attitudes towards the Futuro today? And the answer is A. Um, people still think that it looks like a futuristic object. Um, on line 28, uh, we read, what is intriguing about the Futuro is that, 40 years on, we still see this object as futuristic. Um, why are the others wrong is obviously uh, the question now going through your mind. Um, on line 31, somewhat questionable is not the same as fail to see, which is uh, what B suggests that people fail to see that the design was ahead of its time. Uh, C is wrong because the article implies that people see it as both artistic and practical. And I don't think that uh, D is mentioned uh, at all. Although we, the, the readers, might imagine that it's true that um, people in various parts of the world are keen to preserve them, that doesn't come up at all in the text. Okay, so moving on to the second text, the watercolours of a history waiting to happen. Uh, and question three, what do we learn about David Mandel's paintings from the review? Well, uh, the answer is D. Uh, on line eight, we read about smoke. Uh, on line six, we read about the Statue of Liberty. So 
we are getting there the uh, location and the type of event. Um, answer um, A, they have yet to undergo scientific analysis, is, uh, that's not mentioned in the text. Um, B talks about uh, the paintings being difficult to understand without his written notes. Well, in the text, written notes are mentioned, but there's no indication that they help or hinder any analysis of his pictures. Um, I find that C, uh, they may have been painted after the events they depict. This is very difficult to discount, as a, to decide it's definitely a wrong answer. Um, however, this is my understanding of, of the text. It never mentions that the pictures, it never mentions explicitly or implicitly that the pictures may have been created after the event. It questions whether he is a fake, but this is not actually suggesting that the paintings were created afterwards and that that's how he faked this situation. And in fact, at the end of the text, other ways of faking are discussed. So I think that's um, the reason why we can say that C is incorrect. In question four, in the third paragraph, what is suggested? The answer is B, that the expert had been unable to give an adequate explanation for the dreams. Um, A is not correct, because the claims were being investigated for their total authenticity, not uh, the investigation was not about how exaggerated or not the claims may be, but whether they are genuine or not at all. From line 30 to the end, we see the two possibilities uh, that the expert could see, and they're joined with a but. The ideas are opposing, but no conclusion is drawn, which implies he couldn't draw one. That's why B is correct. Um, for C, we may guess that there was insufficient evidence, but the text never says so. Uh, and in D, we are told that uh, they wanted to find out if he was right, but we don't read anything about whether the mystery of his dreams was answered. Okay. Let's have a look at the third and final uh, reading called Golson Cot. I imagine this is perhaps a small town, probably village, and even more likely it could be the name of uh, uh, an aristocratic house, perhaps, something like that. Um, in question five, then, in the first paragraph, the writer is explaining. Um, well, in A, the, uh, that she felt trapped, oh, sorry, why she felt trapped at Golson Cot, in the text it doesn't mention uh, the writer's feeling of being trapped. Um, it just says that she was able to leave at some point. Uh, in B, why she decided to leave Golson Cot, it says she left, but it doesn't say why. The writer says that people just go in the end and that the same happened to her. So it doesn't give a reason as to why she decided to leave Golson Court. Uh, C. This is the right answer because she says on line 9, but in due course Golson Court became a retreat. This is in opposition to the previous description. Um, so in that respect it shows how her attitude to Golson Court changed. And finally, D, uh, I think it would be a mistake here to assume that seeing it in a positive light meant that she regretted her decision to leave. For a start, we don't know why she chose to leave, as we worked out earlier. And then, finally, question six. Which phrase from the second paragraph reinforces the idea introduced by the phrase, with all that that implied? Notice my pronunciation, by the way, to separate or to distinguish between the two uh, instances of that, my pronunciation. 
with all that that implied. The first one is pronounced that. Uh, the answers, um, or the possible answers, A, ups and downs in daily life. Well, just before the phrase, with all that that implied, the writer is talking about moving from a place where nothing happens to one where things happen elsewhere. And on line 20, she says, things happening means ups and downs in daily life. So, this is the right answer, A. Why is B wrong? Well, this is just some extra information, really. It's not something implied by moving on. And in C, uh, slid blandly into the next, this actually refers to life at Golsenkot, not the experience of moving on to elsewhere. And D is wrong for the same reasons. Okay, so please Take the opportunity to um, pause, rewind, uh, look again at different bits of the, uh, the, the video, um, something you wouldn't be able to do in a, in a lesson in the same way, and make sure that you're absolutely clear as to why the right answers are right and why the wrong answers are wrong. And then, for the lesson, bring with you any areas that are still unclear and any questions you may have about vocabulary that you couldn't sort out uh, with a dictionary. And see you next lesson.